Welcome everyone to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas and we both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky and we have got a huge show for you today. Yeah, I hope you've got a sweet tooth because we're going to be talking about something really sweet and um, something that's really growing here in Kentucky. We're going to featuring maple syrup today. We've got a number of um, the speakers who are going to be talking about the various aspects of maple syrup production here in Kentucky. We also got some other good segments as well, Renee. Mm -hmm, we do. We've got one on um, wood and food. So what kind of types of wood you would like to uh, make your food with and also the tree of the week and forest products week. So it's jam packed again, but I think it's a really good show that we have in store for you all. Yeah, No doubt. So uh, folks, again, we're so thankful to have you all with us um, on a weekly basis. If you're joining us via Zoom, thank you so much. You can interact with us via the chat pod. If you're watching on Facebook Live, please use the comment section and we'll respond to those comments as quickly as we can. So again, folks, thank you all for being with us. I'm gonna go ahead, Renee, and start off with a little video to kind of set the stage about maple syrup production here in Kentucky. And it actually is gonna be featuring um, one of our guest speakers today, uh, Mr. Seth Long. But um, really without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and um, share that video, Renee. Actually, the reason we called it South Down Farm, um, this area here, there was a post office here this is the first year that we had the sugar house built. We got it through a KSU small farmers grant. We have 50 acres here and I'm probably utilizing maybe about um, 20 acres of it right now. There's so, so little time, so many trees. Before this, we've been sugaring for several years, most of the time just for our own, own selves. Last year we did it to sell at the farmers markets. So this year we're doing farmer's markets and we're putting in a commercial kitchen so we hope to be able to do sales, sales outside of the farmer's market yet also. We have 200 taps out this year and I would say that's probably about 170 trees because some trees you can tap more than one time. It's one of the reasons we're so excited about the possibilities for maple syrup in this area because we've got the mountains, we've got the trees and it creates a natural vacuum so you don't have as much initial startup cost as you might if you had to get a vacuum system and all that. Look around people will say that's hillside property it's worthless there's nothing here you know five hundred dollars an acre but there's maple trees all over these hills and we can tap into an untapped resource. If you think about the, the hundreds of gallons of sap collected and it all comes out like this you know I mean that's just it just amazes me how much you can collect. This season so far has been huge and awesome. For here in this area, we've had below the 32 and above more like around 40. We've had that back and forth happening every week. Last two, three weeks, the kid, we've been running it almost daily. Even in the midst of a, a property that's been strip mined, there's redeemable factors when we think about maple. Well, maple syrup is sweet, delicious. <laughs> it makes anything better. You know, we have this resource. Well, that's one thing that Letcher County has is trees. You know, this doesn't take the tree down, so it's not there anymore. Extension has helped. They've tried some things and, and successes and failures uh, that they've had helps inform us about what we should do or what we need to stay away from in doing that as well. So having a, a demonstration project has been really interesting to see hands on too. There's more requests than we can fill at this point, so we're... That's a nice problem, isn't it? It sure is. <laughs> it takes work to cook it down and, and to get everything set up, but there's a lot of people that are interested in the product. You know, you don't have to worry about trying to sell this product. <laughs> if you make it and you make it well, people want it. I take the opinion that there's no silver bullets out there. There's not one next thing that's going to save Appalachia, but I call maple syrup a silver BB just one of the one of the things that could have an impact on agriculture uh, in the state and in eastern kentucky when we think of ag it, we get forgotten sometimes don't we i mean we think of ag and forestry and this is a forest ag product it's it's just right for us well that definitely set the stage for what we're going to talk about 
Yeah, well, what a great video, you know, and it's fortunate, Renee, we have the stars of that video with us today. Yeah, um, we have uh, Seth Long. Seth, if you can turn your camera on, and we also have um, Jeremy Williams and Shad Baker. Um, give a quick introduction to these folks. Um, you know, Seth is the current president of the Kentucky Maple Syrup Association, and he was the star of that video. Um, in addition, we also have Mr. Jeremy Williams and Shad Baker, who made appearances in that video as well. Um, now, you you guys have been working on maple syrup for a long time, you know. Could you give us a little kind of background about what's going on with maple syrup production here in Kentucky? Well, Billy, I was just going to say that uh, we didn't realize, or at least I didn't realize, that you could do this this far south. And around 2008, we were hiking in Virginia, and we saw that there was a little community there called Mount Rogers uh, in White Top, Virginia, where they were tapping there's a local fire department that was uh, tapping maple trees on um, forest service land for their annual fundraiser. And so uh, we took note of this and I'd met a guy from Maine that did this through uh, a farm bureau. And so we started doing uh, a demonstration at the office in around 2012. And Seth was, uh, I think Seth was already playing around with it uh, at that time as well. And so it kind of started for us around that timeline and we started the Maple Schools. Um, UK Forestry had gotten uh, Gary Graham to come down from Ohio uh, State and uh, that kind of launched the whole Maple School idea. And uh, we've had Maple Schools every year, formal schools since 2015. Uh, so um, it, it kind of led into to Seth and the association. So I, I'll let him talk about that part. The, the 2015, uh, I will add, the 2015 um, event was kind of on a regional basis. Actually, probably the first two or three years was kind of on a regional basis. And uh, we started seeing people come to these schools uh, from South Central Kentucky, from the northern part of the state. And uh, they were packing the house out with 50 people. And uh, we started to see that it was a statewide. And we were even, uh, you know, the, Kentucky was even featured in publication, the Maple News. And so we started to hear from, from people through that. So uh, it, it went very well. I think one of the, the, the biggest things for us was the first Maple School that Extension hosted. Uh, where we ended up was there was probably about six different producers in the room thinking they were the only ones in the state of Kentucky making maple syrup. And it just kind of created a synergy for us that we got together and it was kind of infectious. Um, I, I should shout out to Keith Moore of Savage Farms. He showed up at that meeting and you know he, he had at that point maybe around a thousand taps and he was producing and he had been doing it for like 20 years. And he heard about this conference and came all the way down from the Louisa area. And, you know, just seeing what he was able to do in Kentucky gave us the confidence that, hey, we could actually borrow some money uh, to get started in this venture because there's real dollars in it. It's not pie in the sky. And um, that was really our encouragement. That was kind of like the, the, the ground zero event that kind of launched a bunch of different producers to go into it in a, in a bigger, uh, better way. So. It, it was it was really big for us. That was a key milestone event for us. I, I, Seth, I would like to echo that. I had uh, the pleasure of being there at that at that meeting, and the energy in the room was really kind of infectious. I mean, there was so much passion for this product um, and this production. And um, you know, I just wanted to kind of brag on Jeremy and Shad. You know, that's what we hope that extension will do, right? Listen to local producers, work with local producers, and then try to develop and enhance. Um, resources. So just a, it's a classic a success story in my mind. Um, but Seth, you and these other producers have really been at this for a while, you know, so it's, a, yeah. it, it's great to see it have this momentum that it has now. Billy, you know, I want you to hit on something too, that the, the reason why this was so important to Seth and to, to the folks that were in the room that day, this is a crop that uh, takes advantage of land that for the most part, people consider to be wasted land. Uh, it's hillside Eastern Kentucky type land that is not uh, historically been used for, for ag, or at least it hasn't been in the last hundred years. And so this was something that people could do that uh, made use of things that were just kind of wasted before. 
So uh, I think that was some of the excitement. It's very rare that we find a commodity that benefits Eastern Kentucky. Yeah, and if, if I could just follow with that thought there, you know, um, I often use the pun that the maple trees are an untapped resource. And, and using the UK's timber surveys, if you get to looking at the maps, it's fascinating. In the whole state, I believe I counted 42 million maple trees that are eight inches or larger, ready to tap today, just sitting there, not being used. And if you come to the eastern part of the state, if you take Floyd County and the surrounding six counties, there are 6.9 million maple trees ready to tap today, ready to go on, on properties that are just sitting there. Um, you know, many of these properties are owned by absentee landowners and, and could be, you know, a resource for us to, to drive the economy in a, in a different way than it's going in the past. So that's really what gets me going and gets me excited. And I had the opportunity to present uh, at a pitch contest at the SOAR event uh, last year. And I really use those figures to demonstrate the scalability, not simply on our own farm, but what we could do in the region uh, to develop this commodity in the state. I think the sky's the limit for us right now. And Seth's been a great spokesman for the industry and, and the region. Uh, he's kind of taken on that role and um, it was his passion already but when he became the president of the Maple Syrup Association, that kind of gave him the, uh, the medals that he needed, I guess, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to take the banner and run with it. Well, now, Seth, I know that's not a very high paying job, but I do appreciate all that you do for it. I know you volunteer so much of your time and your effort and your energy um, to this. And really, without producers like you, um, this, the association wouldn't exist. So um, I really want to thank you and acknowledge you for all your work. Thank you. And, and the, the really cool part about this is the association is made up of members with the same kind of drive and compassion. And we're really trying to, to develop the association where we have members throughout the state that can mentor other people and ask, answer questions, you know, from the practical level. How do you do this? What are the problems? What do you need as an investment? So I think there's a lot of members like myself that are working hard and volunteering. And I, I'll just shout out to those other producers that are uh, right, right alongside of giving their time and wanting to see this go forward. And I think that's one of the things that we did see were there were other producers, like uh, Seth mentioned, that there were six producers in the room that uh, thought they were the only ones. And so we started to see that. Then we've seen a growth, too, uh, of, of smaller producers that uh, that are actually out there that, uh, you know, I tell people that it doesn't take rocket science that anybody can to, can do this, whether it's your maples or your neighbor's maples. And uh, I think you can make it happen. You know, Jeremy, I think that's a good point. You know, um, talk a little bit, if you all would, about, you know, the different sizes of operations and maybe how people can kind of get started and, and kind of progress on through. Well, Billy, I wanted to hit on that real quick, that this is not a mature type of industry where uh, only the big guys can, can control things. Uh, it's it's uh, something that it's scalable. And so you can start really small and it, it can be for your own personal use. But even the little guys can set up at their farmer's market or sell from home and, uh, and sell out. And, and Seth can attest to, to, to that whole thing. But it goes all the way up to, you know, you get up to the size of Savage and I think that uh, Keith is now like 3,000 plus taps, which is probably the largest uh, producer in the state. If not, it's one of the biggest. And uh, so it, nobody, we've not saturated the market. There, there's a thought that uh, maybe there's going to be so many people producing that it's going to glut the market. We're nowhere near uh glutting the market we, we it's kind of like the, the blueberry thing uh we probably aren't meeting five percent of the demand yeah. you know i thought that was really interesting when i started you know learning more about this there's so much demand for that product um you know that you all can sell everything you produce and we could <laughs> we could sell a lot more if we could produce a lot more you know and i think that's one of the things that i know that got our department um uk forestry and natural resources kind of interested in this that kind of untapped potential if you will yeah Speaking of uh, demand, Billy. we did have a question too, is that, is there enough to support of the startup and long-term investment with the demand? And it sounds like there probably is. 
Yeah, I would I would say that the wholesale market isn't even touched yet. We're just we're just retailing from the farm right now. Uh, the association will get inquiries from you know bakeries or local food groups that want not a lot, but more than what we're producing to start out with. And that would be a good step up from what we're doing. You know, somebody buys 25 gallons of Kentucky made maple syrup to go into their locally uh, made food products. Um, and we can't fill those demands yet with Kentucky maple syrup because we're selling so much right from where we're at. And, you know, my idea on this, you know, especially having a love for the mountains and being in Eastern Kentucky, you know, I want to sell this product away from where there's dollars and bring those dollars home into our community to work. And that's a goal. And I think there's a lot of room to go bigger to, to, to even start operations in the thousands of taps right from the get go um, to get investors interested and start an operation. I think, I think it's a very possible thing that could be done and it would be a good investment, I think. So that, that's some of the excitement that I would like to capture but also to echo, echo what Cher, uh, Jeremy and Chad were saying that, you know, a lot of us started just in the backyard with 10 or 12 trees. And then you just kind of get bit by that maple bug and, and there you go, you're doing more and more each year. So it, you, we, we want to support every level of growth. And, and I want to see growth in, in a large way in the state to where we get statewide recognition as a commodity product. Yeah. Seth, didn't you say at one point that a third, uh, you and your family have a pretty large uh, presence at the local farmers market. You do a lot of uh, diversified hort uh, type production, but I remember you telling me at one point that like it was somewhere around a third of your income from the from the farmers market was maple or maple related products. Is that yeah, still so, accurate? Yeah, I would say it's probably about a quarter of our income, but you can do so much with it, right? And there's so much that we're not even doing with it as we age it. You know, we, we started infusing some of our product, aging it with like jalapeno peppers or habanero peppers, you know, dry them out. We grow the peppers and put them in the bottle and then sell it. You can double your money on a bottle of syrup doing that. We put vanilla beans in it. We, we bake with it. I mean, there's so many things that you can do with it. Hey, hey, folks, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of shift the conversation about maple a little bit. You know, we one of the things about maple syrup production is historically been done in the Northeast, right? And there was a lot of data and a lot of research about what's going on up there in the Northeast about maple production. And then we quickly recognized that we didn't have a lot of data related here in Kentucky. Um, so, you know, that, and I want to introduce and bring on a couple of our um, professors here in the Department of Forestry that are working on some maple syrup grants um, and trying to really further production. So I'd like to introduce, if we could, um, Dr. Thomas Ochudo, um, Dr. John Modka, and Dr. Jacob Muller. If you all can turn on your cameras and um, mics. Um, so these, these gentlemen um, are PIs, if you will, on some um, grants that we have to kind of address and improve maple production. So Thomas, John, Jacob, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. So, so Thomas, I remember, you know, when we started hearing about the maple production, you know, we took a little field trip down to S Place and some other producers um, to looking at some, um, what could we do from the university to try to help these producers be more efficient um, and, and more sustainable in their operations? Yes, uh, so basically uh, that was last year, we got some information from USDA, uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service that they had some grant that uh, we could apply for to help um, uh, local Kentucky uh, current maple syrup producers or those who would be interested in um, joining this as a business a business initiative. So we visited um, two farms, one of which was set um, uh, farm and uh, we also went down to visit uh, farm D if I remember correctly. So well, fortunately, we got a grant from that uh, NRCS um, uh, fund. And uh, actually, we got two grants. And I just want to uh, quickly go over this. And again, uh, fortunately, this year, we were also fortunate to get another grant, a USDA Agricultural Marketing Service. Uh, uh, 
uh, also uh, on maple syrup production. So the first um, NRCS grant was basically to look at um, the potential production potential of maple syrup production here in Kentucky, as has been demonstrated by what um, uh, Seth has shown us in that short video. The potential is there, but there is uh, lack of awareness, lack of uh, if I want to start this, what should I do? How can I go about uh, A, B, C, D? So we are looking at first of all uh, in one step to assess uh, statewide with more emphasis on the eastern part for obvious reasons how much uh, maple syrup can we uh, produce and where are the areas where this can be done so that's with help with the landowners to basically be aware whether their pieces of land um, is a potential place to do this uh, Another important aspect of that NRCS project is to look at the energy conservation uh, step, which is one of the high cost components of uh, dehydration process uh, to produce, uh, to get the syrup from the, the sap. So those are two major components of that first NRCS project. Uh, my colleague who is here with us today, uh, Dr. John Lotka, uh, is also working on a separate uh, but related project that is looking at uh, the biological aspect in terms of uh, species and tree characteristics, uh, how this affects maple syrup volume and sugar content. Uh, you can uh, tell us uh, a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, Thirdly, uh, regarding our uh, recent um, USDA Agricultural uh, Marketing Service uh, grant, this is very heavy on the extension and education component that uh, my colleague uh, Billy here and um, uh, Jeremy and Chad are part of. We are going to be working with KMSA members uh, and we are also going to be uh, working with the uh, KCAD, which is Kentucky uh, uh, Commodity and Agricultural uh, Development uh, uh, Organization to help uh, producers to basically look at local zero production as a viable business mm -hmm. and a sustainable natural resource activity. So in that project, we're looking at going further into developing some educational uh, and analytic tools that would aid the current producers enhance their production and also to recruit new producers to basically consider maple syrup production as a land use, just like uh, we do with soybean farming in, in, in Western Kentucky or uh, other agricultural activities. So that is basically the brief regarding those three projects. Yeah. Well, Tom, yeah, Thomas, I appreciate that. Um, I think it just demonstrates that the, the potential here for maple production and the interest in some of these funding organizations to kind of further that. You know, John, interesting, um, some of your work involves actually tapping trees and kind of measuring sap. So you're actually doing some of this work um, to kind of better understand it. Yeah, and, I, and this has been a great uh, example of how extension and our extension mission here at UK can really help inform research because this is a question the producers brought and then we can do work to better understand uh, kind of the biological drivers of, of sap sugar production in the state and then we can feed that back to them. So the project that uh, Thomas was talking about, uh, we have looked at trying to better understand how maple trees respond to climate in our region or specifically the climate inducing conditions that uh, allow for sap runs. So a lot of the research on sh sugar production is from the northeast on sugar maple. The, we have red maple is more prevalent than sugar in our state and so we're looking at comparing those two. Uh, what are some characteristics about the trees that can you know, give us an idea of how much they could potentially produce in terms of sap volume, but also sugar content. So we're hoping to develop some 
uh, management guidelines that help producers or current or potential producers identify what are the best trees for them to focus on and then also what type of management might they do to their forest stands or their sugar bushes as they're called uh, to maybe enhance that concentration of sugar or total sap production. Well, you know, I'm so excited about the work, um, John and Thomas, you all are leading, because I think we're going to have really relevant information for our producers here in Kentucky and the nearby states, you know. And then just to kind of piggyback on that, Jacob, you know, we recently got the, the large grant from um, the USDA Agricultural Marketing Services, and that really has a heavy extension component. So we're going to be working heavily um, with the producers and with the extension agents across the state. Yep, yep, definitely. And uh I think uh, Billy was being modest. Uh, he is heavily involved uh, with this as well. So I thought I'd mention that, that he, Billy is a, a key partner in, uh, in this uh, maple extension work. And uh, I'll just say that I'm, I'm kind of the new kid on the maple block uh, and uh, new to Kentucky. And I think like most, I was um, kind of surprised to hear about uh, Kentucky being a maple syrup producing region. And, uh, I was invited to speak with uh, the maple syrup uh, folks and Seth and Jeremy and Chad and just seeing their passion about it and then looking into it and seeing all this this really cool research that's already going on. It seemed like a great opportunity to, to use that and, and be able to share that and raise awareness and, and really build on a lot uh, this foundation that, that so many have already built. So. Yeah, so I, I'm, like I said, very excited about this. Um, you know, Renee, this is a really awesome topic. And like I said, it's it's a great story. And I think John alluded to it, you know, where producers come with a challenge to the university and the extension agents, and then we're working together to try to resolve those. So, you know, John, Thomas, Jacob, um, thank you all for your involvement with this. We certainly appreciate it. You know, one of the things that we're going to be working on going forward is the, the Maple School. And Seth and them alluded to that a little bit. And one of the things that Renee's been working on a lot behind the scene is a website for Maple Syrup Production. And, um, you know, Renee, I thought we could maybe um, show that website and kind of plug the Kentucky Maple School real quick. So um, we have created this site for everyone pretty much. Um, and so if you can see here, there are definite, there's different topics at the bottom that we are talking about. Um, one, if you just click here for introduction to maple syrup, um, it will tell you kind of what maple syrup is and how much does it take, you know, anybody who's trying to get interested in it, right? Um, we also have different things that like here at the top, you can go to the history and how maple syrup has started. Um, the research we're going to start, we're going to do a coming, it's coming soon now, but we're going to start putting all them. There's also resources here. You can do videos, publications, websites, and then also tapping if you're interested in it. So it's pretty much a one-stop shop for everybody. Um, we're also, we have two different things going on too, and I can let other people discuss this, um, but we're um, going to do a Maple Day. Um, we did this uh, again la last year was our first one, and we're going to do it again this year. Um, hopefully COVID will ease up by then, and we'll be able to have a lot of fun with that. But the main thing that we're getting into um, that's coming up really quick is the Kentucky Maple School that's uh, going to be on November 7th. So um, we might actually need to talk about that just a little bit to kind of explain what is a maple school. Yeah. Renee, if you'll scroll down a little bit so people can see yeah. the agenda and then Seth or uh, Jeremy or Shad, y'all want to chime in a little bit and let people know what they can expect at that maple school. And I will tell folks it's free, but you do have to register and it will be a via, via Zoom. So one of the things that we uh, have planned to do, this is not the first Maple School that we've had. Um, uh, it is one of many. We were hoping this year to do it in person, but COVID took that out of the picture, but we didn't cancel. We, with the help of uh, University of Kentucky, we are gonna have a virtual event this year and have some keynote speakers. Uh, one, one in particular is Glenn Goodrich. He's from Vermont. Um, and he started with a 25 tap operation in his backyard. And he is one of the leading producers in the US today. So uh, we've asked him to come and share his story about how he went from a backyard producer to be one of the leading producers in the state. And, and we wanted to really kind of capture that kind of vision and energy to, to help people in Kentucky know that, that the sky's the limit and we, we can do that here or something like that. So we're really excited about that. Um, another speaker, 
that's going to be here um, is also uh, Kate Photos from the Future Generations University in West Virginia. And they've done research and practical tapping of black walnut trees. Maple trees are not the only trees that you can make syrups from. You can make it from many different trees. And we have a lot of black walnuts in Kentucky and we want to, the association members want to learn more about how to do this and how to put this into practice. So Kate's going to be joining us and sharing with us what they learned uh, about that. So maybe Shad, you could share about Ben. Yeah, Ben is a producer. He's a third generation maple syrup producer up in Southern Maine. And uh, his claim to fame has been a lot of value added uh, where he cooks with the maple syrup. Uh, he kind of uh, promoted the whole idea of uh, the maple cotton candy which if you've never had it is tremendous. I'm not really a cotton candy fan. I'll <laughs> eat it, but it's nothing special. But the maple cotton candy is the bomb. It, it's <laughs> really, really good. And it's addictive. It's like a chocolate kind of addictive. <laughs> um, but uh, he does a lot of candied nuts and uh, they do a lot of maple candy and uh, just different baking. And it's a family operation. His daughter's involved, which is kind of similar to Seth. And uh, so he's going to be doing some hands-on uh, cooking with maple as part of the maple school. Yeah. So folks, we encourage you all to register for this event and please share it with others, right? Please help us get the word out about this. That's one of the great things I love about this audience. Um, this, this group that kind of tunes in weekly, you are so good about sharing this information. So please help us spread the word about this upcoming event. So, um, you know, folks, we've got a lot, a lot more content we're going to try to cover today's show, but I, I thank all of you all for your um, involvement. We will drop a link so you can find that registration um, into the chat pod, and you'll find there, and we can also post it on our Facebook page as well. So, again, Renee, what a sweet topic that is, you know, yeah. uh, and, and, you, and you know, we're going to keep the kind of the, we're going to keep food, on going. We're going to make all these people goes. hungry before we even get to lunch. I know. So we're going to make everybody starving. So um, we have with us um, Eric Gracie. And I don't know if Eric wants to come on for Eric in a second, but um, Eric has created a nice video for us. Um, Eric, you want to kind of intro your video a little bit before we play it? Sure. Uh, basically, um, uh, I kind of profile. I noticed in the, the tree of the weeks, Lori was showing uh, some of the uses for some of the species and uh, and barbecuing was uh, mentioned for several of them. And I'm a hobby hobbyist when it comes to smoking. I've not competed um, or anything like that, but uh, uh, it's just kind of a passion of mine. Um, some people eat to live and I live to eat. So uh, <laughs> I've uh, pursued this little hobby. And what I've done is, is there's a uh, I don't know, probably eight or nine different species of hardwoods here in these here in Kentucky that are well suited for uh, your grill and your smoker. Kind of just profile the uh, the smoke flavors and what wood or what food pairs up with those uh, with those species of wood, and uh, hopefully it'll help some folks out. Right. Yeah, I know. I always have questions about that. It's like, what food is good with this? So it'd be nice to hear it from an expert. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Eric, thank you for your time. And let's go ahead and um, share his video now, Renee. Yes. Yeah. Hello, I'm Eric Gracie. I'm a management forester with the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And today's topic is we're gonna talk about our native hardwood species that are well suited for uh, barbecuing and smoking applications. We're gonna look at the, the different uh, smoke uh, uh, profiles and what foods pair up well with the uh, different uh, species that we have available to us. Okay, we're gonna start with Kentucky species that produce the mildest smoke and then we're gonna work our way up through the species that produce the heaviest smoke flavors. Uh, so uh, the maple, sugar, and uh, red, uh, like the red maple behind me, are well suited for uh, smoking. Uh, they produce a very light, uh, slightly sweet uh, smoke flavor. They're, they work well with uh, uh, meats that you don't wanna overpower with smoke, such as fish, uh, game birds like quail, uh, Cornish hen, or uh, just regular chicken and turkey. Uh, these maples work really well for in those applications. Okay, so another uh, Kentucky species that uh, produces a mild uh, 
smoke flavor is our uh, black cherry or wild cherry um, and uh, they're gonna work well with the uh, the uh, previous meat products that I mentioned this is a good one to have uh, in the back of your mind that it uses uh, on your grill okay the last two native uh, species of Kentucky trees that produce a uh, light uh, mild smoke um, are the red mulberry unfortunately I do not have a red mulberry on my property uh, but I do have a sassafras and sassafras um, uh, what you're going to want to do with this is uh, you'll want to remove the bark if you're going to use it for smoking the bark does contain a chemical in it that uh, that may uh, have produced a little bit of toxicity uh, so you want to remove that uh, bark uh, and after that uh, it's going to produce that you know how that the, they use the sassafras root to make root beer and you're going to get that little bit of sweet spicy uh, taste transferred over to your meat and this this uh, uh, species works really well with chicken. It, it makes unbelievably uh, good smoked chicken with sassafras. Okay, so the next uh, step is we're going we're gonna to talk about our medium smoke uh, flavored native species. Uh, these medium uh, 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 smoke producing uh, trees are going to be well suited for just about everything that you're going to want to put on the smoker. They're going to work well with uh, beef, uh, uh, venison, uh, they're going to work well with turkey, chicken, uh, pork, you name it, these things are going to work. Uh, Maybe a little strong for fish, but uh, I would say that they would also work well for uh, salmon and some other of the big, big flavored fish they would work uh, uh, well with. Okay, so the first uh, uh, group of species we're going to talk about uh, that produce this uh, medium smoke flavor is our white oak family. Kentucky's blessed to have numerous different white oak species such as the chinkapin oak behind me. Uh, the white oak's gonna produce kind of that quintessential smoke flavor. It's uh, not really gonna be super sweet. It's not gonna be really super nutty. Uh, and it, it really works well with uh, the, uh, uh, basically anything that you're gonna wanna put on the, the smoker or grill. Okay, so the next uh, medium uh, smoke species we're gonna talk about is, I'm gonna loop, lump them together, is hickory and pecan. Uh, like this little pecan I'm standing next to. Uh, so it's hickory is uh, basically what 90% of the commercial uh, restaurants and barbecue stands are using to smoke. It uh, produces a nice, sweet, nutty taste. It works well with everything. Pecan, which is uh, much more prevalent in the western part of the state, is going to produce just a little less, uh, a little milder flavor, uh, and but it's going to taste a lot like hickory. Okay, so the last medium species uh, that we're going to talk about is my favorite. Unfortunately, I don't have a tree to stand next to, but it's apple. Uh, apple is uh, well suited for uh, all the uh, meats that I've mentioned previously. I like it because, it, uh, one, it smells absolutely wonderful while it's on the smoker, and it produces light, sweet smoke that really pa pairs well with the, folk, the stuff that I like, chicken, uh, pork, and I actually use this for salmon as well, and it, it really makes a nice salmon. Okay, so we have two uh, native species that produce a really strong uh, smoky flavor. It's uh, red oak. Um, it's red oak, and you will want to experiment with it. In my opinion, it gets a little bit of a bitter smoke. I'm not a real big fan of red oak, but there are uh, folks that really like it. So uh, don't take my word for it. Try it yourself. The other is uh, black walnut. Black walnut uh, produces a really heavy, strong smoke. If you've ever burned it in your fireplace, the smoke smells absolutely wonderful with it. Uh, but I would caution uh, using it alone in your smoker. It normally works better if you're mixing it with uh, some milder woods. Say if you don't have, a, uh, you mix it with an apple and walnut or an oak and a walnut. Something uh, like that would uh, be better than just trying to use black walnut by itself. Okay, so we're going to finish things up with a uh, couple suggestions. If you're if you're cutting and producing your own uh, wood that you're going to put on your smoker, such as these hickory uh, chunks that I've got here, you're going to want to make sure you season them just like you would firewood. Uh, you know, unseasoned wood's going to produce creosote in a smoker, and that creosote's going to make your uh, meat taste really uh, bitter and nasty. Um, also, don't overlook the use of uh, hickory nut shells. Uh, they make great chips. They're good in your smoker, they're good on your grill, they'll really uh, spice things up uh, in your cooking. And 
like I said, everything that I've passed on is just kind of my opinion and personal preference. It's going to be the fun of, of barbecuing is the experimentation to find out what you like, the woods that you like, and what you enjoy. And you really can't go wrong. It's hard to produce uh, something off of a grill or smoker that's not good. You're making me hungry, I can tell you that. <laughs> I know that's what I was thinking. I was like, is it lunchtime yet? Oh. Almost, almost. <laughs> but um, Eric, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, people have type in if they're typing something in the in the chat pod for any questions, but how did you get interested in doing barbecue and do you have any secrets you want to let us know? Uh, well, um, actually I was uh, fumbling through uh, um, the two million channels you get on television anymore and there was a show called Pit Masters. And it was a kind of a documentary of uh, the uh, barbecue circuit and how folks like Myron Mitten and uh, I think it's Johnny Trigg have made hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars going to these uh, 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 barbecue contests. And it just, uh, it was interesting and it kind of got me uh, uh, not thinking about making money doing it, but just all the different techniques that they were using and showing us like, uh, so went out and got me a smoker and tried it. So uh, that's kind of what got me going. Um, as far as, I think you said something about secrets. But, yeah, you have any uh, secrets but, you want to let us know? Yeah, the big one is that if you're not brining, then you ought to try it. Uh, it's real simple. Um, it's an ounce of uh, coarse salt and an ounce of brown sugar to a pint of water. And you just uh, use that mix till you can uh, completely cover whatever meats that you're, uh, that you're uh, gonna uh, brine. And from there, you can do a lot of different things with it. I normally will add uh, some lemon juice or sliced lemons, whole peppercorn, a bay leaf, garlic. It just kind of, if you're doing chicken, you can throw some rosemary in there. It's just from there, that's your base. And then you can just kind of flavor it to how you like it. But uh, those are, that's probably one of the things that a lot of folks aren't doing that they ought to think about doing. Well, thank you very much for being on the show today. We and I was going to brag on him. We're fortunate to have Eric on our team because um, we have a holiday party and Eric always brings us some good smoked salmon. So Eric, um, thank you again for sharing your, uh, your expertise and your passion for good food. Yeah, no problem. Awesome. All right. All right. Moving on to tree of the week. I'm wondering what tree we're going to talk about this you know, week. I know. Let's see if Laurie wants to give a little pre preview of what we're going to be talking well, about. What else could we do today besides sugar maple? So yeah, that's <laughs> the tree of the week. It is, I will say, one of my favorite trees. Um, and it was one of the first trees I learned to identify too. So it's a beauty. And even right now, I mean, you're seeing it and it's in full show. So um, enjoy the tree of the week, sugar maple. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the sugar maple. Sugar maple, Acer saccharum, is one of the most well-known and beloved hardwoods in the United States and Canada. In fact, more states have claimed sugar maple as their state tree than any other single species, and it's the National Tree of Canada. It's the state tree of New York, West Virginia, Wisconsin, and Vermont. It's also called hard maple or rock maple. Sugar maple is slow growing and long lived. In fact, it can live to be three to 400 years old. Sugar maple typically grows 80 to 120 feet tall and up to three feet in diameter. This beautiful tree is a wonderful landscape tree and an important timber tree and is the principal source for maple syrup production. Sugar maple's native range includes Eastern and Northeastern North America. Sugar maple is a common forest tree in Kentucky. It commonly occurs in rich, moist woods in coves and other sheltered locations on the lower slopes, but it can also be found growing on drier uplands. Sugar maple grows in loamy sands and silt loams, but does best in well-drained loam soils. It is very shade tolerant and only American beech equals it in shade tolerance. Sugar maple is a deciduous tree with oppositely arranged leaves, as you can see in the photo. The leaves are simple in form and about three to six inches long. They typically have five lobes and the margins are entire or smooth as compared to red maple that has serrated margins. The leaves are palmately veined with the veins originating from the central point at the base of the leaf. The leaves are green above and pale below. 
sugar maple with its beautiful form and brilliant multicolored display of fall color is a popular shade tree in eastern North America. And fall colors range from gold to orange to vivid red. Sugar maple can be either monoecious, male and female flowers on the same tree, or dioecious, with male and female flowers on separate trees. The flowers are small, light greenish yellow, and they hang in clusters of 8 to 14 flowers, and the flowers are on slender stems. They bloom slightly before the leaves emerge. The flowers are wind pollinated, and sugar maple seldom flowers before 20 years of age. The fruit is a double or paired Samara which has wings, and the wings are papery in texture. The paired Samara resembles a horseshoe shape. They're about one inch long and hang in clusters. Usually only one of the paired Samaras is filled with a seed, but occasionally both Samaras will have a seed or be empty. When mature, the Samaras turn yellowish green and fall about two weeks after they ripen in autumn. Trees start producing seed between 30 and 40 years, with good seed crops every two to five years. Seeds are dispersed by wind, and seeds have an extremely high germination capacity of up to 95%. Sugar maple is also capable of vegetative reproduction by stump sprouting, especially in the northern part of its range. Sugar maple has value to wildlife. It is commonly browsed by white-tailed deer, moose, and snowshoe hare. The seeds, buds, twigs, and leaves are eaten by red, gray, and flying squirrels. Porcupines eat the bark, and in some instances even girdle the upper stems of trees. Numerous cavity nesting birds nest in sugar maple, including chickadee, flicker, pileated woodpecker, and screech owl. The bark is light gray to grayish brown. As the tree grows and ages, the bark develops furrows with long, thick, irregular, firm ridges that appear to curl outward. Sugar maple wood is tough, durable, hard, heavy, and strong, thus the common name, hard maple. The sapwood of sugar maple is commonly used for lumber, and it ranges in color from nearly white to cream color with a reddish or golden hue. The heartwood tends to be darker and kind of a reddish brown in color. Bird's eye is a figure, and a figure describes the distinctive pattern that results from various grain orientations in the wood, but bird's eye is that it's most commonly found in sugar maple. It's called bird's eye because the tiny knots in the grain resemble small bird's eyes. The figure is reportedly caused by unfavorable growing conditions for the tree. Sugar maple can also have curly or quilted grain patterns. Sugar maple is an important and valuable timber tree that is used to produce products such as furniture, veneer, paneling, flooring, gun stocks, sporting goods, bowling pins, and musical instruments. It's also the wood used for NBA basketball floors. It is also the primary source of maple sugar and maple syrup, which is, very, which is a very important industry in much of eastern North America. The national champion sugar maple is in New London, Connecticut. It's 219 inches in circumference, 123 feet tall, with an 86-foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion sugar maple is in Davies County. It's 207 inches in circumference, 90 feet tall, with a 91-foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest National Register of Champion Trees, or check out Kentucky Champion Trees with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. Now for a few fun facts about sugar maple. Maple trees are tapped in early spring with the first flow of sap. The sap is collected, boiled, or evaporated into a syrup, and it takes 35 to 50 gallons of maple sap to produce one gallon of maple syrup. Sugar maples had numerous historic uses, including making soap from the ashes, drinking the sap as a tonic, and making a dye from the bark. During the 2001 baseball season, Barry Bonds switched from the traditional ashwood bat to one made of maple and hit 73 home runs. The scientific genus name for sugar maple is Acer, and it's from the Celtic auk, which means hard, referring to the wood, and the species name Sicarum is from the Greek Sicharin, which means sweet or sugar. Thank you for joining me to learn about the sugar maple. I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy the showy sugar maple. Well, Lori, we greatly appreciate you doing that again. And, um, you know, one question I've, he I've heard today, I've heard red maple, I've heard sugar maple. How do you tell them apart? 
Um, the leaf is the easiest way. A red maple leaf is going to usually only have three pointed lobes and the edges of those margins are going to be serrated, have the fine tiny teeth in it, where sugar maple typically has five lobes and you will not have any of the serrations on those leaves. So yeah. Excellent. I was going to say if you're looking to plant sugar maple this fall, and I think the Kentucky Division of Forestry, they've already sold out of the seedlings for um, or taken all the orders for sugar maple. So you'll have to look elsewhere, but maybe uh, the next year you could uh, get your order in earlier with the Division of Forestry. Yeah. I do really greatly appreciate you doing it week after week. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're a huge part of the show. So thank you, Laurie, very much. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we've got another one of our team members is on today, and it's a, he's got a special event that's happening, and um, we have Mr. Chad Nyman. Um, Chad, glad to have you with us today. Thank you for having me, Billy. We've had a lot of great forest product coverage on the program, and Lori always does such a great job of talking about some of those uses of these different trees of the week. And as you all know, this is Forest Products Week. It's the third week in October, and this is something that we've been celebrating since back around 1960. And so it's a great uh, bringer together of people uh, with all of these great products that our forests provide for us. So I'll go ahead and bring up this PowerPoint that I've got together here. And so just to kind of generalize a few things, we've got the timber and non-timber forest products and just to keep it really general, because we don't have a lot of time, uh, when you think of timber forest products, think of like wood and paper, things with housing. Those non-timber forest products, also referred to as non-wood forest products, um, things that are non-timber, like uh, edible forest mushrooms or Christmas trees, are things that I've got listed there just for a few examples, but we'll go into a few more of these and uh, just to talk about uh, the great, one of the great benefits of forest products is that they are renewable. And what that means is that the resource will not be depleted. And we've got forest growth offsetting trees that we remove from the forest in a harvest setting. And so we know that we're growing about three times more wood than we harvest in Kentucky on a year to year basis. And we're largely working off of that natural regeneration from those seed from adult trees or mature trees. And uh, for all of this to happen, that growing space needs to not be developed. Those woods need to be protected from invading insects, plants, and disease that Dr. Ellen Crocker talks about in this program and some of our other episodes. And so all of that needs to be accounted for for and having forest managers, different foresters involved in these processes can help in planning and making sure that your objectives are being met that you want to achieve. And so just thinking about, you know, where do our wood and forest products come from? Uh, we all have different interests. I hope that we'll be able to highlight some of the different ways that your life might be a little bit different without forests and all of these all the folks that are involved in producing these forest products. And I mentioned, you know, farm to table initiatives in recent years have talked a lot about, you know, where different parts of our food may come from. And so these woods to goods programs kind of help to explain where some of these wood and forest products come from. They highlight things like local wood usage and having a general awareness to supply chains and manufacturing that we all rely upon and how those local and regional supply chains can allow for more value being added to locally produced products. And so one of those ways that your life might be a little bit different is we think about you know, where different parts of housing come from. And so the framing of a home is typically softwood, pine, spruce, and fir, but you've got things like hardwood flooring, and doors and cabinets, stair treads and banisters, things like tissue and toilet paper have become very popular items in conversation with everything going on with the COVID pandemic. When we look at wood, it really is a future material and multi-story construction, whether you know it or not, mass timber is coming 
Most of this so far is almost exclusively softwood due to the building codes. A recent study on carbon storage uh, that was conducted by the Yale School of Architecture discusses how adoption of CLT and mass timber has the potential uh, for storage of potentially gigatons of carbon. And there's reduced environmental impact of those building materials, uh, things that are really desirable or a faster construction timeline uh, with those pre-made panels, which reduces costs of construction. Wood being an insulate material, it has the potential to reduce urban heat sink. We know that just the way that we build our cities, they can be as high as eight to 10 degrees warmer due to the materials that we're using in the construction. And there's also improved resilience from earthquakes, explosions, and charring in a fire. I've got some images here of just a few of those uh, recent construction projects. I would like to mention that Woodworks has got a great project gallery, and I'd encourage you to visit that website and look at some of those mass timber and cross-laminated timber projects that are being constructed and completed. I'd also like to highlight uh, University of Kentucky's Woody News uh, Facebook page. We talk about all kinds of different wood usage and try to be a cross section between our forests and the products that they produce. You know, a lot of oaks have got a lot of musical inclination. I love music, uh, things like guitars, banjos, dulcimers, pianos, all of these type of wooden instruments. They wouldn't be possible without wood in the forests that we have. We've mentioned so many great forest foods on this show, persimmon uh, being a great tree and a great fruit. Uh, pawpaws have been discussed on this show, the maple syrup that was discussed today. A lot of folks don't think about honey uh, being a forest food, but a lot of our hardwood trees have great uh, flower and nectar and pollen uh, for honeybees to collect, not to mention the boxes that a beekeeper would keep their hive in is made of wood. Shiitake mushrooms being grown on white oak logs. So many great forest foods. A lot of folks don't think about bourbon and whiskey being a wood product, uh, but bourbon itself is required by federal law to have a new charred white oak barrel or cask and the production of that bourbon. And so it actually is one of those critical ingredients that would not you wouldn't have bourbon without having that white oak. And so 95% of bourbon is made in Kentucky. It's a great local value added product story in a cyclical economy. And it's somewhere around $10 billion of wood aged or matured spirits uh, to the Kentucky economy. that We can thank our forests for recreation. A lot of folks uh, love to get out and enjoy hiking, wildlife viewing, uh, campfires, maybe some subsistence hunting or gathering. Uh, sports are a big thing in our society and culture. Everything from persimmon golf club heads, Louisville slugger baseball bats, uh, hockey sticks, bowling lanes, basketball courts, so many things that wouldn't exist in the capacity that they do today without wood products in our forests. And uh, I just want to mention briefly, you know, usually we'll have some activities on campus to highlight these wood to goods activities and some of the campus wood upcycling program and campus sawmill activities that we have. Um, we do have here on the left is a picture of some slabs taken from pin oak trees from around the new Gatton Student Center. And you can see those live edge tables are now installed with a storyboard explaining the whole process in the ballroom of the student center. And you can see just outside of the student center ballroom there is a red oak tree that was just recently taken down and slabbed out with this Lucas sawmill that was recently donated by with funds from the Coca-Cola company. And so we've got exciting stories that we try to engage the campus in as well as upcycling some of these campus trees that are getting old and, and they're dying or having rot and disease in them that may make them unsafe for heavy
foot trafficked areas. So trying to use that wood in, in the classroom and getting students engaged with these unique materials. And that is all that I've got for Forest Products Week. You know, I think people just, they don't think about all the products that come out of the woods, whether it's something you're eating or something your house is made out of or what have you. Um, people just, you know, they, they need reminding about what actually is out there. Absolutely, Renee. And this is a great opportunity to highlight some of those things that are around us that we take for granted. 2020 has reminded all of us of that, I believe. Definitely, definitely. Well, thanks again for that presentation, Chad. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, it was very good, Chad. Thanks for all you do, really. Right. Well, it looks like we are done for today. Did it again, um, Renee. Another yeah. great show. Wow, jam packed. Yeah. Yeah, and next week um, we have Forestry 101 Part 5, so Dr. Muller will be talking about that, and we're going to do some things because it's close to Halloween, so we're going to do some creepy things from the forest, which will be a very cool segment, um, different things that you're like, what is that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's cool, of course, Lori will have her tree of the week, and I think uh, Matt Springer will be doing some kind of creepy wildlife sound, too, so we're, we've got another jam-packed show for next week. But uh, we hope everybody joins us at 11 o'clock on Wednesday of next week and uh, go to fromthewoodstoday.com if you need to see any of our shows that you may have missed. Yeah, no doubt. We appreciate you all being with us, whether you're joining us via Facebook Live or via Zoom. Thank you so much. Um, I, I will note real quick, I did put a link in if you want to register for the Kentucky Maple School. It is free, but you do have to register. So please um, check out that link. And again, thanks to all of our presenters today for a great show. And Renee, way to go. Good job. Right. See you all right. next week. Bye.